Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. Welcome and thank you for joining us this afternoon. The next hour is devoted to learning something more, not just about the world of shoes and ships and sealing wax, but about how, what, and why we believe as we do. A time for the open-minded, willing to challenge some of those old ideas behind what we think we know, who we are, and who we might just become. I'm Eldon Taylor, and this is Provocative Enlightenment. All right, our chat room is open, as usual, and my lovely partner, Ravinder, awaits you there now. You can log on by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. Ravinder, tell everybody why they should log on to your chat room. Because it's a fabulous chat room. And what else? Because uh, we have a great group of people. They all uh, bring something new, some more information. They answer questions. They come up with their own perspective. So I learn a whole lot from the chat room. So, yeah, do come join us. That is provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. All right. In this week's spotlight, I'd like to address optimism. We've all heard about the power of intention and positive thinking. Optimism is comprised of both, but for it to have any real value, it must also maintain a realistic perspective. It must be reasonable. Reasonable optimism is often anchored by hope. The opposite of optimism is, of course, pessimism. In the affairs of the mind, pessimism can lead to helpless, hopeless feelings, that literally decimate our own self-healing faculties. Indeed, as a number of animal experiments have shown, when it seems that there is no escape, no hope, animals lie down, accept the suffering, and eventually die, even if they could escape the stimulus that is providing their pain. Now, I think these animal experiments are gross, but if they are to have any value whatsoever... It is in what they teach us. I would argue that they teach two things. The potential in human way in which humans can behave. And, of course, the intended objective. That when we give up, our immune, endocrine, and other major systems of the body give up as well. So the challenge. What is a healthy, realistic form of optimism? It certainly isn't one that quits on life, but it is one that takes into consideration the projected reality we live in. Let me flesh that out a bit with an example I live with. My wife was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis years ago. According to her diagnosis, she would be unable to remain ambulatory, and by today, well, we all know how severe this disease can be. Now, my pretty bride ignored her doctors when it came to the prognosis or the projection of where she was headed, but she did not ignore all medical advice or scientific research. She committed herself to beating the disease and using science and medicine, she did just that. Now, the contrast. A family member was recently diagnosed with RA as well. My wife reached out to them with help from her experience. Unfortunately, they rejected this by informing Ravinder that the doctor disapproved of any alternative approaches and they would just have to live the progression of the disease. In the first example, that of my pretty bride, there was a reasonable optimism that maintained hope, while in the second example, that of a family member, there is a pessimistic acceptance of what they consider to be the inevitable. Allow me to make this point with one final illustration. In the 50s, Kurt Richner performed what has been called the horrible experiment. What Richner did was to place rats in a glass cylinder filled with water. The rats could not escape. That became obvious to them. And during the first trial, they died relatively quickly, on average within 15 minutes. Now rats can swim for quite long periods in nature. So in experiment two, the rats were placed again in the same cylinder filled with water, but this time Richter would rescue them after a few minutes. Removing them from the water, 
drying them off, pampering them a little, and then returning them to the cylinder. This time the rats could swim for up to three days. That is the power of hope. Never give up your hope. Reasonable optimism refuses to surrender because it is firmly anchored by hope. It is my hope that you will all remember this and hold on to hope right to the very last breath. And as a Star Trek fan, let me add, may you live long and prosper. Your thoughts on this, Ravinder? Yeah, I'm a Trekkie too. That's kind of cool. Um, I would have to second, first of all, you know, those animal experiments are truly horrible. And there is so much of that that goes on that is so unnecessary. They replicate and never mind anyway. That's a whole subject by itself. But, you know, when it comes to the um, the self-responsibility part of it, the optimism, you know, I've actually had a few things where the doctors have said, oh, you know, that was it. I would have that. Just like when I uh, first started wearing glasses, I started wearing glasses. What was I? That was around 30 mm. at the time. And I, I, I got my glasses, but I was determined to get out of them. And I did. And then I didn't have to wear glasses again for another 15 years. And then it was just reading glasses that I wear now. 15 or 50? 15. Okay. I, I thought somehow you'd magically super aged in one night or something. <laughs> Not at all. I'm going to stay forever young. That's my job. All right. Um, but yeah, I'm also glad that I totally ignored my own rheumatologist as well, because he was totally against um, alternative medicine of any kind. But me, I went out searching. And you do have to be careful with some of these things. You know, there's always someone on some street corner wanting to sell you some technique. So, you know, you you have to watch and do your research carefully. But I did mine. And uh, yeah, I tried a technique that the doctor said was a total waste of time. And I cured myself. So Bottom line, I met. you were hopeful that there was a remediation possible. And instead of accepting the judgment, yes, um, you I went sought looking that. for and it. It was your hopefulness that kept you, uh, shall I say, that fired your tenacity because you didn't find that remedy right away. It took some time before you did. It took a little bit, most certainly, um, but yeah, that um, that attitude of self responsibility. You know, you you often talk about the authority figure and the power of the authority figure well these days whenever i hear an authority figure say something negative oh you know you'll always have that you'll always you know you'll always have this problem just accept it it makes me so mad because there isn't anything more powerful than the power of hope uh, you're, you're absolutely right and, and our listening audience should recognize that research shows us using fmri technology that in the presence of an authority, when they tell you something, the area of your brain that discriminates turns off, just shuts down. You just accept it. You walk away. It's like a fine. And, and so Ravinder is very right. Whenever you're told something by an authority, remind yourself, am I using discretion here? Am I evaluating this carefully uh, before you just jump to conclusions and say, oh, my goodness, I guess that's how it is, and that's the way it will end. All right. Every week I read some of your letters as our way of involving you while paying respect to the very important role you play in making this show successful. Last week our show featured Dr. Michael Bennett, and we discussed his book, F Books, F Love, and F Feelings. Joan wrote, what a great show. The bleep at the end of the show tells us all. Dr. Bennett is straightforward, if nothing else. He sure is, and thank you, Mr. Ryder, for catching that one. We don't need any FCC fines. CB commented, I get the feeling we would not see this gentleman speaking at a Hay House I Can Do It convention. Uh, you know, CB, that's probably reasonable. Bennett is one of those folks that, um, you know, accept who you are and get on doing your best with it, and that's how it is. Aaron wrote, there is no such thing. I'm sorry. There is so much garbage peddled under the guise of self-help today, promising riches and rewards by just imagining them that we need more Bennett's telling us how it really is. 
Moving on, JT wrote this about my book, Gotcha. As a physician and neuroscientist, I find myself engaged in frequent discussions of reality and the concept of free will. I begin by describing Dr. Benjamin Libet's early experiments on the timing of conscious awareness and his discovery of readiness potentials, signals that can be picked up by scalp electrodes one-third of a second before we register conscious awareness of a volitional act. This early work, later verified by fMRI, suggests that we follow a pre-programmed path in life with only a small window of time where we may, if we are focused and paying strict attention, affect a change. Dr. Taylor's Gotcha presents chilling information to help us understand how we are also guided by external forces, which for the most part are not in our best interest at all, but work in concert to keep us in the dark with sheep-like minds and actions. I give this book unequivocal thumbs up and a five-star rating as a required reading for those of us in the process of waking up. Well, thank you, JT. And Andrea wrote, I used to use your InterTalk programs about 15 years ago, and I found them amazing. And now, because of life changes, I need to find some new ones and use them again. Please send the catalog. Well, your catalog's on the way, Andrea, and for any of you out there, you you know, you can get a catalog online by just simply visiting Intertalk, I-N-N-E-R-T-A-L-K dot com. One word. All right, that's all the time we're going to take for letters today, but I do invite you to opine by emailing me at Eldon, E-L-D-O-N, Eldon at EldonTaylor dot com, or by joining me on Facebook. We sincerely appreciate your comments and feedback. Now to this week's show, When Technology Fails, with Matthew Stein. Today's guest has been with us before, but for those of you who might have missed that show, let me tell you a little bit about him. Matthew Stein is an environmentalist, best-selling author, National Merit Scholar, MIT-trained engineer, green builder, and recipient of the Straight T Award, MIT's highest athletic honor. As an inspiring speaker and visionary thinker, he is dedicated to helping people wake up and unite to shift our collective course from collapse to global renaissance. On the practical side of things, as an expert at self-reliance, emergency prep and survival, his writings and work help people prepare to weather the storms we are facing due to continuing climate change and ecological decline. He is the author of two best-selling books, When Technology Fails, A Manual for Self-Reliance, Sustainability, and Surviving the Long Emergency, and When Disaster Strikes, A Comprehensive Guide to Emergency Planning and Crisis Survival. They're both great books. Ravinder and I use them as references, um, and we'll be discussing both today. So on that, let's get him in here. Welcome back to Provocative Enlightenment, Mr. Matthew Stein. Eldon, such a pleasure to be on your show again. Thanks for having oh. me back. Oh, it's indeed our pleasure. I've been looking forward to this conversation for some time. But for those of our audience who are not are familiar with you, uh, Matthew, I'd ask you, you know, tell us a little bit about who you are and what motivated you to immerse yourself so deeply in the subject of disaster. Well, I grew up in Vermont, uh, skiing, hiking, hunting, fishing, canoeing. Uh, my parents were avid outdoor enthusiasts, and uh, I've always liked working with my hands and uh, been a carpenter in a building, uh, you know, built built houses and buildings, green buildings. But, and people ask me, well, why would an MIT engineer write a book called When Technology Fails? I mean, I'm supposed to be a guy who kind of worships technologies and thinks that technology has got the solution to all of our problems, and yet I, I write this book about uh, the probable and likely failure, widespread failure of technology. And back in 1997, at that point in time, I'd had a 20-year practice of mostly daily meditation and prayer. And uh, I made a very generic request in the beginning of my morning session of meditation. And I got a bomb draft in my lap that day. I received instantaneously dumped into my head a massive pictorial sort of three-dimensioning, three-dimensional holographic storyboard outline. Like like artists will sketch out scenes from a movie to help a producer or director figure out how they want to 
structure various scenes in a movie, so I received the same kind of outline, but it was for a massive book project to help people live more sustainably and more self-reliantly and to plan for and deal with long-term uh, failures in our central systems, meaning you know, long-term grid down, long-term financial collapse, long-term nothing much in our technological society functioning for a, a very significant period of time, probably most likely running into multiple years. And so that was really quite a rude shock. Uh, I had certainly felt myself ecologically aware and, and didn't like the signs I was seeing in the world of, of long-term collapse and if we kept doing things the way we were doing. But I kind of thought it was you know, way out there and I didn't have to worry too much about it, maybe for my kids but not for myself. And I'd never considered writing anything remotely like this book. I mean, I'd written one children's story before then and hadn't published it yet, a couple of trade journal articles, but nothing like a book. And this was massive. This is like 10 term papers in one. And for me, a term paper in MIT was a big head-banging ordeal. And to receive this massive book fully developed and laid out for me, uh, you know, was, it was clearly from some other source far beyond my capability to do that. And it took me about a year to decide I could it was a good idea, and I was capable of taking it on. And a year to write a, read about thirty books, and find a publisher, and write a proposal, and, and then another year to work like eighty hours a week, and rack up the credit cards, and bite the bullet, and and uh, finish it off. And then I put another year into updating in two thousand and eight. So, it's a, it was a huge project, and and uh, kind of I was a bit of a reluctant person taking it on. It, it took me a while, quite a while, to uh, decide I was up to the project. Let's pursue that for a minute, if we can, because the titles to both of your books suggest that, you know, some massive failure, perhaps even on a global scale, um, is imminent. Um, you receive this from a source outside of yourself. We'll just, you know, um, I don't know if you think of collective consciousness or a divine essence, but... Um, so my question would be, Matthew, do you believe that it is imminent, that we are going to go through disasters and technological failures, and we should all be just preparing for that? I believe it is imminent in the sense that I'm 60. I'm quite healthy. I've been an athlete all my life. I eat you know, healthy and meditate and and try to take care of myself. I believe that I'm going to see it. Uh, I believe that collective consciousness of humanity may choose to make different decisions and alter the path we're on to lessen the crash. Uh, I, I, the longer we take to change the way we do business in the world, and, and, uh, and as long as we the longer we refuse to acknowledge that we're destroying the natural systems of the world that make life livable for humans and other mammals on the planet and pleasant, um, then, the, then the less likely that the crash won't be extremely severe. And so um, I, there are several black swan events, things like solar storms and EMPs, electromagnetic pulse from a terrorist attack, uh, or uh, perhaps a, uh, a pandemic that could cause the collapse to happen very quickly and catch most people by surprise. But you know, if we don't have an event like that, then certainly between the degradation of the oceans, the degradation, the, the, the changing climate, uh, the population that's uh, consuming resources in the, on the Earth faster than they can regenerate, a whole variety of things. I've identified six trends converging on collapse in an article I wrote called The Perfect Storm, Six Trends Converging on Collapse. So the natural consequence of just continuing on our exponential growth that we've been on for thousands of years, uh, but it's coming to a head right now. Uh, we're, we're going to collapse these systems if we keep doing business as usual. There's like no way around it. We're on a finite planet, but we're pretending like it's infinite. We can grow and consume the Earth uh, as much as we want for as long as we want with no consequences. And that's becoming clear, I think, to most people nowadays that uh, that we just can't do that, that, that you know, what seemed like we could go on forever a couple hundred years ago, we're, we're clearly running into natural limits now. Okay. When I read your books and, you know, uh, some of your other material, 
what I see is um, a, a, a form of bifurcation. I mean, there is the personal uh, side of preparation, and then there is this collective. How do we change the collective, change what everybody's attitudes are? So let me divide that a little bit here in, in our discussion. On the personal side, if we take on some of the more controversial areas, such as self-defense, what's your attitude towards guns? And should every home uh, have a weapon inside of it? Well, my attitude towards guns is, you know, I'm, I'm sort of a reluctant gun owner myself. Um, I'm not a a real gun. I'm not a gun enthusiast. There's many things I'd much rather do with my time. I acknowledge that in the event of a collapse, having something for self-defense or hunting, if necessary, or for trade and barter, for any of those reasons, is, I believe, a, a good thing to have. But that's naturally a personal decision. I do believe in the power of community and that you're much stronger united with other people than you are alone. Uh, think about medieval times when people traveled in caravans because there were bandits that would kill, rape, and take everything you had, and maybe you'd be left alive, and maybe you wouldn't when they were done with you. So in order to avoid that nasty end result, you, you had to travel in groups, or there was safety in numbers. So... You, you know, if you're not in favor of having a gun and you're partnered with other people that perhaps have different views, then at least you have that safety in numbers and community. And I don't believe anybody can know and do it all. And the well-armed uh, lone wolf survivalist, if he's way out in the boonies and nobody knows where he is, he'll probably be fine. But if he's not, then somebody who's meaner and tougher and better organized than him is probably going to come along and take all of his stuff away and perhaps leave them alive, and perhaps not. You, know, you just don't know the outcome of that. I don't... I, I hope that I never actually have to shoot somebody in my life to protect myself or somebody else. Uh, I hope that's something that never comes to me. But I also acknowledge that in desperate times, uh, you know, you might need it. I certainly wouldn't use it to take some stuff away from somebody else, but if I needed to protect friends or family or others, then think that's the worth a, a reasonable objective so adequate preparation really if you were counseling your your own sons would be to own a weapon and take an attitude such as that that you have uh that it is for all intent and purposes uh, a method of protection uh in the worst possible scenario protection trade and barter possibly hunting. Uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is, growing up in Vermont, I, I don't hunt now, but I did as a child, and uh, the last day of hunting season, nobody wanted to go hunting on the last day. They wanted to go on the first day. And uh, the truth the truth is that in a class-type scenario, it would be like the last day a hundred times worse. So your chances are much better knowing how to forage than using a gun for hunting. And, and there's a lot of people who think that well, i got a gun, I go hunt, and I'm a manly kind of guy. But there's a, an interesting anecdote I'd like to tell on that that, that sort of illustrates this point. Now, I was on the radio about 10 years back with a guy from Arizona who teaches primitive living skills and survival. They learn how to do things the Native American way, you know, you know foraging and, and right. snares and all that kind of stuff. And after a week of learning these skills, they typically go out. They go out in the wilderness for three days. They're not solo. They split, split into groups. And usually the men go out and focus on the manly thing of hunting and fishing, and the women go out and focus on the traditional, more female roles of foraging for edible fruits, nuts, tubers, berries, things like that. And he said almost invariably, come day three, the, uh, the women take pity on the starving men. And people always laugh at that one and, and share their bounty that they foraged because they find that the men, especially in Arizona where he teaches, uh, without modern tools like fish hooks, guns, and knives, uh, are pretty 
<laughs> they're not very successful at hunting for their food, whereas the foragers uh, are far more successful. So uh, that's, that's something well to remember. Is is the uh, and so I would encourage my son to develop self reliance skills, to develop self healing skills, because you can't just go around the corner to your local pharmacy or doctor. To develop, um, you know, various a whole variety of things that could make one useful in a situation where you can't go to Costco and you can't go to the grocery store and there's no gas coming out of the gasoline pump and there's no water pumping out of, no potable water that's coming out of the water system, nor our sewers working. Gotcha. Well, we'll talk a little more about that after the break. We have a hard break coming up here. So we're speaking with Matthew Stein about his books, When Technology Fails and When Disaster Strikes. You can learn more about our guest by visiting his website, whentechfails.com. Now, we have a video for you in our chat room featuring our guests discussing ways to avert non-sustainable programs that can lead to disaster and failure. So if you're not in the chat room already, now's the time to get over there. And you can do that by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. We'll be right back. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment with Elton Taylor. Change has never been easier. Whether you wish to lose weight, stop smoking, build better relationships, become creative, enjoy ultra prosperity, or simply relax and promote self-healing, InnerTalk has been repeatedly demonstrated effective in the most rigorous of scientific studies. Our customers love InnerTalk. Sean wrote, I have struggled with bulimia for over 30 years and have never been able to lose weight without restoring to it until I used InnerTalk. Vicki wrote, My hubby has been using the Stop Snoring CD, and already his dangerous and raucous snoring levels have stopped. Celeste wrote, I recently graduated from Taft Law School with honors. I'm writing to tell you how much your inner talk CD, Excel in Exams, has helped me. With over 300 titles to choose from, there is something for everyone. Check it out today by going to innertalk.com. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. Welcome back. If you just joined us, we're chatting with Matthew Stein about his books, When Technology Fails and When Disaster Strikes. You can learn more about our guest by visiting his website at whentechfails.com. Now, we ask our guests for their favorite music, music that has some true significance to them. As you know by now, music psychology is a new field of interest for me and a field of research with practical relevance in many areas, including intelligence, creativity, personality, and social behavior. So on that, we just played some of The Hurricane by Bob Dylan. Tell us, Matthew, why is this music important to you, and how does it inform us about who you are? Well, um, Reuben Carter is the man known as The Hurricane, and he Mm -hmm. was on track to be... I think, like, medium-weight boxing champion of the world. And he was falsely accused of murdering people, something he had nothing to do whatsoever. He wasn't anywhere near there at the time. And uh, he was imprisoned. I mean, you know, he thought it was a stupid thing and it was done, and they ended up, you know, jacking up charges against him and getting people to lie. and, And he spent many, many years in prison. And yet, he maintained his character this entire time. He he did not become bitter. He did not let it totally ruin him, even though you know financially and his life was ruined. And in, in in the respect of spending the best years of his lives behind bars for on false charges, but he maintained his character until the day he died. And so I just you know that kind of courage and strength. To stay true to who you are, in spite of circumstances, is, is to me very, just very inspiring. I love it. I love it. 
You have a chapter in your book, sir, When Disaster Strikes, that is, that deals exclusively with surviving a, a, a nuclear disaster. And we've got all kinds of stuff going on in the world, and there are some that believe we're living on the edge of a nuclear disaster, and if not from a rogue country like North Korea, uh, then from a dirty bomb carried by a terrorist, or perhaps another nuclear power plant failure. So two-part question, sir. Is it truly reasonable to expect to survive such a disaster, and if so, how? Well, it's, it's totally reasonable to expect to survive the disaster, a disaster like that. Uh, in things like both a, a dirty bomb and a nuclear meltdown, on the scale of things, are, are, are things that are quite survivable. And uh, you simply, dirty bomb especially, you just simply have to get out of the affected zone. And there's not going to be, the, the main problem with the dirty bomb is that there's going to be large areas that uh, it'll destroy the businesses within those areas because nobody will want to come there. Uh, you know, because it's polluted with stuff. But your chance of actually getting a, a, a dose that causes you to be sick or, or, or fatally injured is, is pretty slim. In the nuclear meltdown, it's much more long-term and insidious than the dirty bomb uh, in that the downwind people, um, and that can be all over the place, stand a chance for uh, long-term sickness and illness and death and disfigurement and you know, in multi-generational uh birth defect. So, for instance, you know, outside of Chernobyl, there's areas 150 miles away from Chernobyl that are not inhabitable today. So if you look at the map, it's, it's a, available on Wikipedia if you look up Chernobyl. You'll see these hot zones where the debris settled from Chernobyl, and they're not all right next to Chernobyl like you think. Some of them are a long ways away, and they're permanently you know, for generations to come, nobody can live there where they risk uh, illness and death. And supposedly, it, you know, if you read some stats, they say, oh, only a couple hundred people died in Chernobyl, no big deal. Well, the Russian Science of Academy uh, studied it in epidemiological study, which means they looked at health statistics for a wide area, and they found that a million people died early premature death due to Chernobyl, and three million more people were sickened. So Chernobyl AIDS, which is a acquired immune deficiency from the radiation poisoning, is very, very common in all over you know, widespread areas. And uh, the Chernobyl necklace, thyroid tumors, is just like 25%, 30% of the people in the villages around Chernobyl have them, and you know the children are sick. And you're seeing this happening to a lesser degree from... Fukushima in Japan, and and now they're forced doing forced resettlement. Uh, well, not this, not forced, but they're they're encouraging people to resettle back into Fukushima, and they're taking away their government subsidies to help them live because they had to abandon their homes. So they're now saying, "quote It's safe now. You can go back to your homes. Uh, you know, we cleaned it up." And yet, my good friend Arnie Gunderson was there with a the radiation suit and and. Uh, Geiger counters, measuring devices, finding that there's areas that are in, quote, safe and clean where the winds and the rains have brought stuff back, right? you know, in the months after they, quote, cleaned it up and repolluted it more severely than areas that are permanently, uh, that are, that you're, they're basically verboten in, in Chernobyl and in uh, the Ukraine and, and areas of Belarus, you know, around there. Those are areas that are permanently cordoned off and nobody can live there. And yet uh, the Abe government of Japan is is uh, trying to claim it's behind them and they've cleaned it up and it's okay to move back. So it's survivable, but you need to use your brain and you need to be aware and not just listen to the government. So, for, for example, after Chernobyl, they in, rather than doing the right thing, which is to say all of the downwind areas, um, they must quarantine so that all of the animals, all of the meat products, all the vegetable products, all the dairy products and eggs and things like that are, are just going to be destroyed. Instead, what they did was they mixed them in. So you couldn't tell where it came from. So everybody got their little dose of radiation. And and the result is, you know, if they if they'd really been careful and on top of it, 
maybe there would be a fifth the number of people who got sick and died as did after Chernobyl, by, just simply by being really careful. And so you as a, a citizen have to be aware and know about the reality of this and get out of downwind. Now, there are a couple of events that are extremely horrible. In the event of an EMP attack in the United States, there's a potential for many, many Fukushima-like events to happen in the United States at once, where, and that's where a high-altitude nuclear burst from some country that wants to really stick it to the United States, gets their hands on a missile, a nuclear device, country or terrorist organization, blows it off in the upper atmosphere, say, you know, 30 to 200 miles over the surface of the Earth, and this electromagnetic pulse goes out and disables most of the electronics, essentially all of the complex digital control systems within that area. Meaning, will your iPhone work? Probably. Will your car start? Good chance of it. Uh, Will the pumps of the gasoline work? No. Will the cooling systems in the nuclear power plants? No. They're going to go Fukushima-like. Will your sewage treatment plants work? No. Will your oil refineries work? No. You know, will your telephone and Internet work? No. Nope. You know, so, so all the stuff you really care about won't work. A lot of your small electronic devices would. So in that event, that's the end of the United States as we know it, because, you know, you could have 40 or 50 uh, nuclear plants going off at once, and then your only hope would be to go west, young man. Go west, young man, and get out of that zone, uh, which is not a, not a pleasant thought, and, and I sure hope it never happens. But it's, it's better to educate yourself and know the reality of the threat. So if that day ever comes, then you can make appropriate actions. And you can take some precautions ahead of time, like having some N95 air ma- you know, masks, like painter masks at the hardware store, and water filters, and air filters for your home. Things, you know, certain basic stuff that's not real expensive, but extra food, the ability to move on down the road if the car doesn't work, you know, all of those things that you hope will never happen. You know, in emergency preparedness like car insurance. Nobody I know who bought car insurance says, gee, I'm insured. I want to get in a head-on collision today. You know, you, you hope you never use that insurance. And I hope that I never need the emergency preparedness stuff. Unfortunately, uh, the indications are that one way or another at some point in my life, unless I die younger than I appear to be, that uh, they'll end up having to use it someday. So, but, you know, if I never use it, great. <laughs> That's wonderful. If I don't have to use any of this stuff, I'm, I'll be overjoyed. Gotcha. Let me ask you this, since you brought up Fukushima. Uh, we're hearing all kinds of stories about contamination in, uh, in the fish um, in the Pacific now and uh, how it's reached uh, California coast and food growers uh, are aware of it. You know, w- w- what is the situation truthfully there, Matthew? Well, my truthful opinion is that it's getting into the food chain, primarily in the fish. Um, about produce, I certainly wouldn't want to, you know, have kelp produce from anywhere near Japan or that part of the world. It's, it's, I still eat salmon uh, to a small, you know, I feel like the benefits of the omega-3s are really good for my body. But I also take motophyllin every day, which is a, a juiced kelp extract. And what the, after Chernobyl, there was, Various Russian scientists figured out that this, uh, this juice-dried kelp extract called modifilin, M-O-D-I-F-I-L-A-N, I don't make any money off it, I don't sell it myself, but it's modifilin.com, they found that it chelates to heavy metals. So what it does is when you take this kelp extract, it bonds to strontium, uranium, plutonium, but also things like mercury and lead, and helps your body pee them out through your urine. And... So it's got a lot of great bioavailable iodine and other micronutrients, and it it also dumps the heavy metals. So just to, as a matter of, you know, that's more of my insurance. I take a couple capsules of modifilin every day so that uh, the trace amounts are coming my way. Hopefully my body will take care of them and dump them out rather than hang on to them and perhaps lead to a cancer downstream. So so I I use my head, but if, for example... Um, I was much closer to it, or it gets a lot worse. 
like if the spent fuel ponds in Fukushima start burning into the atmosphere because, for example, there's these blown up buildings that have 10 Chernobyl's worth of old fuel rods on top of them, and the buildings are quite rickety. And if another earthquake came along and toppled the remaining structures at Fukushima, and those fuel rods, once they're out of water, um, they'll start burning like Roman candles. They, they're encased in a material called zirconium. Steep plain steel would get brittle and fracture because the radiation levels are so high in the fuel rods, so they encase them in zirconium. But zirconium burns like magnesium when it, when it gets really, really hot. And so uh, after Fukushima, I, I saw them spraying the reactors with huge fire hoses, and I thought, don't, what kind of idiots are these guys? You know, they don't they know they can't cool a reactor core by spraying water in the outside of the building? Well, they weren't as stupid as I thought. <laughs> My good friend Arnie Gunderson, who was number one in his class in nuclear engineering, uh, gave me some lessons on nuclear. I'm, I'm a mechanical engineer, not a nuclear engineer. And he, he educated me quite a bit on the subject, and it turns out that on top of the roofs of those buildings were 10 Chernobyl's worth of fuel rods, and the water was no longer being pumped into those ponds, so they were going to start boiling dry. And so those engineers knew that they it was absolutely critical that they keep water in those ponds, and that's what those big fire hoses were all about. They weren't trying to cool the reactor cores. They were, they were just keeping water in the pond so they didn't have a Chernobyl-like fire burning, you know, 10 Chernobyl's worth of radioactive material into the atmosphere and sending it all over Japan and all over, you know, across the world. So it's a, it's a serious event. Um, you know, Fukushima and Chernobyl were both extremely serious events with large consequences on populations that were polluted by significant amounts of the material. Are we getting polluted significantly in the West Coast? No. But one particle of plutonium that lodges permanently in your lungs is enough to give you lung cancer over time. So it's a statistical crapshoot. Um, if you happen to get enough stuff concentrated in the food chain into your body, or if you happen to breathe something in, ingest it, and it gets lodged in your body, you know, 10 years down the road, how are you going to know it was Chernobyl or Fukushima that caused it? How are you going to know? Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> Not exactly inspiring, but interesting. No. Let me ask you this. I mean, Matthew, you, you're you're a very spiritual person. You're a meditator. This, uh, you know, your work is very comprehensive, and and I will accept that it was just given to you. Um, so that all tends to lead me to two conclusions. The first one is <clears throat> it must be something that's important, or it wouldn't have been given to you, and that bears relevance on how we live every day now Uh, the second one is what it must be like for you you know optimistic spiritual guy you 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 teach blind people to ski you're an athlete uh what it must be like for you to be continually immersed in all this you know fear and uh and whatnot well i'm not so much immersed in fear as I'm, I feel that, you know, knowledge is power, and that I've been gifted this to help people awaken. One is so that you can be ready for, you know, various levels of things falling apart in our world. And two, that if enough people awaken, you know, we might actually change the course so it's not so cataclysmic. And... You know, on, on the one end of the, of the things, it's like uh, everything totally falls apart and most of the population dies. And on the worst scale, it's an extinction event where a million life is gone because we blew it so badly. I, I don't think we'll hit that, but it's certainly conceivable we could, especially with the nuclear issue. And on the other level, it's, it's actually waking the planet up to the point where the people of the world take their power back and say, look, we're conscious beings. We're stewards of this amazing planet. We cannot pretend like our actions aren't affecting this planet negatively. We, we must be real stewards, not fake stewards. We must make stewardship and, and sustainability 
really the number one priority. We can do this. When in World War II, after Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt uh, called all of the big guns, industrial guns, uh, you know, industrial industrialists in Detroit together and said, look, gentlemen, got them all in one room and said, look, this is do or die. We, we either get behind this war for 100% and defeat Hitler, or you're all going to have German bosses, and most of you probably will be executed, and, and our world will never be the same. And so he set targets that people believed were unachievable. And in every instance, they met those targets. And in some instances, they far exceeded those targets. And that kind of effort can change our world. That kind of effort can bring about global renaissance. So it's not just all about gloom and doom. It's also about saying, look, we've got ourselves into this mess. Mother Nature will get out of this mess in a very unpleasant way for human beings. And most, if not all of us, will not survive if we continue disregarding the natural rules of Mother Nature. But we can step up to the bat. We can do a program with a priority along the lines of defeating Hitler. And we can turn this around and build a global renaissance and build a planet that is that stewards the planet properly, that, that treats nature and the natural systems of the world as critical functions that, that must be preserved and must be protected if we're all going to survive. And, and so we can do that. So, so you know, there, there is an optimistic view here. But in the reality, also, you need to do what's right for yourself, your family, your community, your country, and the world. So I, I see action on all levels, and that includes being ready on, on the personal level for myself and family. So if that day comes, my family doesn't have to be drinking out of a ditch and looking at me like, you know, why didn't you do something? You knew this day might come, and now I've got diarrhea, and I'm vomiting, and I can't hold anything down, and I'm sick as a dog. Because I had to drink out of a ditch, and there's, you know, 10,000 or a million or 100,000 people peeing and booing everywhere, and, and I'm not protected. And, and you knew you could, for, you know, a few dollars, have prevented this situation. So, so there's, I'm saying be practical. Be positive. Be practical. Be positive and real. Don't be unrealistically optimistic, Pollyanna, but don't focus on all the negativity and darkness either. But, but be real. Be real. Well, that was the subject of uh, our spotlight today. We have about one minute. And, you know, I want to turn a second to the collective because that's where you are and the population expansion on the planet. It's estimated that we'll have 10.5 billion people between the years of 2040 and 2050. There are all kinds of positions on this. Advocates that want sterilizations in some countries, etc., what are your thoughts in 30 seconds, sir? We must educate the women of the world. We must be stewards of the world. We must make that a priority. When women are educated and brought and lifted up, they take care and control over their body and the reproductive side of things. And if we don't do that, we're going to lose the planet because in the last 10 years, more people were added to our population than from the time Jesus walked the earth until Abraham Lincoln. Get that through your head. Jesus to Abraham Lincoln, 1,800 years. The last decade, we are adding more. And every decade, we're doing that. We cannot keep that up. We must be proactive, or Mother Earth will be ruthless in its response to our irresponsibility. All right. Two books, When Disaster Strikes and When Technology Fails, I have earmarks. Oh, I don't know. There's probably 20 earmarks, little tags on both books. It's two books you want to have and you want to have in your home. And um, I can't recommend them more than that. I want to thank you, Matthew, for your work and for your willingness to share it with us. We've come to the end of another episode of Provocative Enlightenment. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. And until next time, wherever you are in the world, remember... Believing in yourself always matters. Provocative Enlightenment has been brought to you by Progressive Awareness Research and other sponsors. 
Provocative Enlightenment is a syndicated show and appears on other networks. For a schedule of showtimes, visit ProvocativeEnlightenment.com. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor, write to Eldon at EldonTaylor.com.